um, tag runtime. We're part of the CNCF, so it means that we adhere to uh, the code of conduct of CNCF. Um, today we have two presentations on the agenda, but if you'll have time, it, uh, we could always open it up for more topics if you have anything that you want to share. Um, so the first one on the agenda is the uh, introduction to Construct, uh, Moritz uh, and Paul. And see so you both here, so I guess we could uh, start. Yes, uh, good from our side. Thanks, Daniela. All right. Um, I prepared some slides for, let me see, sharing my slide screen. Let's see. Um, now, when I start the presentation, do you still see slides? Great. Yeah, definitely. Perfect. Um, yeah, um, thanks for, for having us. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, you reached out through the GitHub of Contrast and asked if we can present this here at, at Tech Runtime, um, and we're happy to do so. Uh, from the agenda, we thought it might be good to give a brief in, uh, background uh, about the, the fundamentals that, that Contrast is dealing with. These, these would be confidential computing and confidential containers. And then we can uh, go a little more deeper into, into contrast and, and Paul will also do some more, a demo or a, a practical uh, example. Right, so some, some, some background, I think it might be good, not sure if everybody here is, is, is familiar with, with the things we're dealing with. Um, I think the, the first fundamental thing we need to understand is, is called confidential containers. Um, but let me, let me start from the, from the, from, from, from the start. Um, the thing that that we uh, at at the company we're working for edgeless systems and, and the topic we, we're dealing with there is, is called confidential computing which is fundamentally a, a new hardware technology that allows to keep data encrypted in memory um so this is mostly or first first and foremost a, a cpu instruction set extension that allows to create yeah, an isolated environment. And in this isolated environment, you have uh, memory encryption for these memory pages. Um, and you have an, an, an isolation, which means um, only the context from within that environment can access these memory pages, uh, nothing else. And, and as the last feature, you have a form of remote attestation, which means from the outside, you can verify what's running inside this environment. So this is the base we're dealing with. This is a hardware technology providing us with these features. And it's delivered with the, with the latest generations. Uh, it's delivered in the form of a VM isolation, which means we can create confidential VMs. So a VM which uh, is isolated from the hypervisor, is isolated from other VMs. Um, so let's say uh, we're in the cloud. We have some hardware stack. We have a hypervisor. Uh, we create a bunch of, of VMs. Uh, now, with this technology, the, the CPU takes care of that. No other VM, no underlying thing like the hypervisor can access my guest, can access my, um, my, my, my VM. Um, and that this main memory of, of this VM is encrypted in the actual physical uh, memory of, of that, of that, uh, of that uh, CPU or that, that server. Right, so this is this is the the technology that's provided by AMD by by Intel. Um, there's also a specification from ARM, but there's so far no no silicon for that. Um, and this is something that's now available um, with the, the the most cloud providers. So most cloud providers can provide you with uh, confidential computing offerings in in the form of, of infrastructure as service, where you can consume. Uh, a, a confidential VM as, as the fundamental uh, building block, essentially, based either on AMD or on, on, on Intel these days. So this is the, the fundamental technology. Um, and we, what we've been dealing in the last couple of years is the question, how can we provide this to cloud native workloads, right? What software do, you, do, we, need, do we need to, 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 to build to deliver that Right, deliver this isolation mechanism to, to your cloud native workloads in terms of making use of the encryption and the isolation, making use of the attestations so you can actually verify um, what, what's happening there. Um, 
and 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 most of all not need to deal with this low level parts right if you're just an application developer if you're just a um a, maybe a platform administrator you don't need to deal with this low level hardware based based stuff so um this was confidential computing and the vm um the the vm kind of kind of delivering mechanism right the vm based isolation now the question if we're talking about cloud native workloads and, and and i guess here in the in the tech runtime um we are mostly dealing these days with a, with a Kubernetes environment. I mean, this is a simplification, but I think it helps for the understanding. So let's say we have a Kubernetes environment. Um, the question is, how can we apply this, this isolation to our software that's, yeah, first and foremost delivered in, in, in the form of containers and in Kubernetes, right, we, we package them in pods. So the question is, where do we apply this in, in, the, in the Kubernetes stack? And just from a logical perspective, mostly if we're not talking about bare metal, if we're just talking about public cloud and hyperscalers, mostly these control plane and, 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 and worker, uh, worker nodes, they are um, provided in the form of VMs, right? So there would be a one-to-one -one match in terms of abstraction and, 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 and in terms of, of, of isolation. Um, our actual workload, the thing that we really care about, the thing that, that we want to protect now, get in a second to why we why, why what might be a use case or why we want to protect this but just from a from the our end goal right this is where where our code is this is where our IP is where our data is this is just uh, usually a, a container right so that basically gives us a spectrum of how we can apply this on, on one hand we can apply this to just the nodes right just the, the Kubernetes nodes isolate an entire node and throw whatever we want to throw in there and if we do this with all the nodes and we bring this together in a cluster. Um, we usually call this a confidential cluster. And this is one concept that exists in the confidential computing world. Um, there's also, we are building a project called Constellation based on that, but this is not the focus on contrast. So also not the focus on, 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 on this presentation. What the other side is basically really focusing on the things we like to protect, applying this technology just to our containers, just to our Kubernetes pods. And here, um, as I've just tried to describe is there's not a one-to-one -one match, right? There's a container and there's a VM-based kind of isolation. So the first question and the first thing we need to solve is how, how we, how we um, close this gap in terms of, 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 of abstraction, um, right? So how do we isolate a pod inside a confidential VM? And what people... Um, immediate or what people saw, I think the thing is, is running for 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 yeah a couple of years now is that there exists already a concept or a project that does precisely that: run containers inside VMs. And this project is called Kata Containers. There are other projects as well that do similar things, but this is the foundation for 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 for, for confidential containers um, right now. Um, so Kata Containers, the idea is that basically we want to um, protect our host environment from uh, containers that we run on it. That was the, I think that was the initial, the initial idea. Um, and we want to do something stronger than just um, regular Linux namespacing or whatever is being used for a container-based isolation, because we might uh, assume that there is a container escape or something. So by basically adding a, a VM type of isolation, uh, level two hypervisor um, below our container, we have a stronger form of isolation. And Kata Container basically does that um, by, by adding some components in, in, inside our stack. So let's assume we have a container runtime. Um, let's say container D. Um, I don't need to go into all, all the details here, I guess. But uh, instead of basically creating all those 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 namespaces and 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 um, running our container um, uh, inside these namespaces basically we take a um, um, we take a hypervisor uh, or like a like a kvm we create a, a minimal um, vm with a with a custom kernel and some agent and we run our container inside that 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 minimal micro vm that's roughly the idea of confidential containers which is great, right? Because it gives it closes this gap of, of abstraction. Um, running a container inside a VM instead of uh, just a regular container runtime. A 
applying this concept basically just means now instead of running our container in a regular VM, we run our container in a confidential VM. And there was started off as a as a, um, a project inside the Decada project, and now being its own CNCF sandbox project, started confidential containers, right? Which takes this concept, applies Kata containers, puts it together with confidential VM-based isolation like AMD or uh, AMD SCV or Intel TDX, and isolates your pod inside this this confidential VM. Right. And as I said, it's a sandbox project. It works. Uh, it also works with, with IBM Z. Um, they also have a, a similar technology. Um, and you can do this in, 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 in let's say, in, in three um, um, flavors, you can call it, right? If, you, if, if your Kubernetes nodes are just bare metal machines, right, this is straightforward, right? Let me go back two slides or this one slide. If your if your Kubernetes node is a bare metal machine, uh, you have a host operating system. It has a KVM um, and some um, uh, user space code to it. You can just create a VM inside this bare metal machine. Easy. If you're running inside the cloud and you don't have a bare metal machine, then you have two options. One is you create a nested virtual machine. Nested virtual machine means basically right. You're already inside a VM. Now inside this VM, our guest kernel. Provides the yeah provides an again a KVM hypervisor and we create a nested virtual machine inside this environment. It's, it's, it's slightly more complicated and requires um, it, it, it already exists for regular VMs. For confidential VMs, this is a bit more complex and this is not something that, for example, the open source uh, Linux hypervisor the KVM already does or already uh, is capable of. Instead. Um, 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 only the, the, the Azure Hyper-V um, hypervisor is currently able to do that. So the, the workaround, if you don't have nested virtual, virtualization, is basically running this, um, this VM instead of being, instead of a nested VM, we basically cut off here um, where we, at the, at the cutter shim, basically we inst instead of talking to our local hypervisor, we talk to the cloud API and tell it, hey, please create us a regular VM somewhere in the cloud we create this VM. We do all of the things that we do with this VM, uh, right? We 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 pull the container, we load the container inside that VM, um, and then we we tunnel all of the traffic, all of the stuff to to the cluster back and forward. Um, and for the cluster, it looks like there was just a VM started, right? And for the VM, it just looks like it, or for the pod inside this VM, it just uh, feels like it's running inside the cluster. And this is a workaround for not having an asset virtualization. Sorry, yeah, just 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 mentioning that. So yeah, this is confidential containers. This provides us with this runtime running containers with confidential computing isolation inside uh, a Kubernetes environment. That's the found foundation. This is basically where we where we started off with with contrast. One more thing before I dive into contrast: Why are we doing this? Right? Why is this interesting? What this gives us is is a form of isolation uh, inside an, a, a novel way. For for um, designing the trust model in the cloud, so far right, if you deploy your workload in the cloud, you basically have to implicitly trust the entire stack below, right? You have to trust um, the infrastructure, the physical host, the admins that have access to those layers, like the hypervisor, the host OS, and so forth. You have to trust your, your uh, provider. Sorry, um, I, I have a, sorry to interrupt you. I have a question. <laughs> uh, is there support now for? Um, uh, Devices, uh, H100 devices, uh, directly talking to them uh, from from a uh, Kata containers or or yeah, you know, from, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You can um, from, an, from an isolated VM. Yeah, you I mean, can. I saw the H H100 on previous slides, so that's why. I... Yes, let me let me go back. Yeah, I mentioned N Nvidia H100 says yes. Um, Nvidia has has for for the for the Hopper architecture for the H100, it has um, added confidential computing capabilities to the GPU. Which means the GPU has has, has similar um, um, features in terms of isolation and in terms of attestation. It does not encrypt the memory. Instead, they say that the memory is, is inaccessible physically uh, and provides the same kind of security as a, 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 a encryption memory engine. But that's just details. Um, and you can connect an, an an H100 to your CPU. So the CPU does attestation with the H100. It verifies 
that this is a really an H100 from NVIDIA and has a confidential computing um, mode enabled and so forth, and basically establishes a secure channel to this H100. And this can be yeah. connected to a, a confidential container as well, yeah. Awesome, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, sure. I think this is super, super relevant now because um, a lot of people are using GPUs for uh, running uh, AI type of workloads and yeah. having that, uh, having that uh, isolation for security, I mean, it's great, basically. And yeah, that's what a lot of a lot of organizations are looking for. That. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, totally agree. Um, yeah, but this means that you have you need to have two things available at the same time. You have to have available the the H one hundred and the let's say the confidential uh, VM uh, type of, of, of processor, um, and this combination as of now does not exist in the cloud. So Azure has uh, nested virtualization, I've mentioned, right? They can provide you with confidential containers. Google and Amazon, they provide you with um, a peer pod mechanism to start confidential containers. Um, other clouds might do, do other things. Um, and only Azure so far has H100s in a preview state where they provide you with the confidential computing mode of, of H100. But you cannot combine the, the confidential container um, nested virtualization enabled uh, clusters with these H100 so far. But this is something that will happen uh, sooner than later. In the future, sometime in the future, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Makes, sense. Makes sense. Thanks. Sure. Um, right. So, so long story short on this slide, basically what this allows you is it allows you to isolate your workload, your container from the entire infrastructure, right? This, this means if, let's say, uh, in we are we're consuming a managed Kubernetes. Um, you have this entire stack below you, and you have all of these entities that have access to that stack. And these entities might be malicious, or they might be, be compromised. Right? This is because you have. This means this is the, the current trust model of the cloud. And now with this with this isolation, yeah, you can you can cut off and you can say, okay, my workload is is isolated due to this technology, and I trust the hardware vendor. I trust Intel to implement this isolation correctly. And then I have this form of remote attestation. Uh, we don't, we didn't go into the details yet of remote attestation, but this allows you to verify from remote based on a report from the CPU that this is indeed your workload is indeed running inside such environment. And there's a, yeah, a verification chain back to the hardware vendor, back to Intel or AMD. Um, so essentially, you you reduce the the the, the trust in the cloud. Um, to this hardware vendor, to this hardware component, and you can cut off the, the, the stack in between. Um, and this is interesting for at least the use cases we're, we're dealing with, um, right? This is uh, mostly for right now for, for, for regulated industries for, um, in, in like, like healthcare or finance, um, also in Germany, a lot of like public sector um, that want to do, uh, want to migrate stuff into the cloud um, or want to consume more more, more cloud services, um, but they are um, um, either not allowed to do so or very hesitant to do so. Um, but yeah, um, there are other use cases that are not just based on, on, on regulation um, where you can really, um, in the SaaS uh, context, you can really um, do very strict tenant isolation based on this and can really ensure and your customers can even verify with remote station that stuff is isolated from, from each other. Um, right. Um, well, that was just the, 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 the preamble. Um, so the question that with this setup, right, we have this, this confidential computing environment. We have confidential containers as this uh, CNCF uh, um, sand, sandbox project. The question is really, how do we get started? How do we, do we use it? I have here my application. It's containerized. I deploy it on Kubernetes every day. I don't know, with help charts and YAML, YAML files. How do I consume this? And this is this is the story of, of how we started with contrast, right? So the question is, I have here my deployment on the left-hand side. I have my Kubernetes cluster. It's enabled for confidential containers, for example, using that, that, that preview on, on Azure AKS. The question is now, how do I use it? How do I really uh, um, deploy uh, my container inside a confidential container and then what does the how how do I play this this trust story? How how do I verify that everything was applied correctly? Um, that that was the the big question. And the first thing we 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 did or we you can do is basically change the container runtime inside your YAML files and tell it, hey, please start this in a confidential container runtime. And this will do exactly that. It will use this cutter uh, mechanism for 
creating confidential VMs for all your pods. Um, and that's it. Um, and then the 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 the, 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 the questions that, that we were facing is right right, how do we verify all of these individual pods, right? We can do remote at the station for all those individual pods, verify that they indeed have been run, are running inside a confidential container environment, that the correct pod image was applied there, that all of the stuff that we've defined inside these deployment YAML files, they have been correctly applied to the runtime environment of this pod. Yeah? So assume like, I don't know, runtime uh, uh, environment variables, mount points, um, um anything that um i can define in those in those yaml files and um also note that we don't trust anything beyond our isolated environments we don't trust the kubernetes cluster we don't trust in this thrust in this threat model we don't trust the kubernetes uh control plane the api server the dequeuplet anything that's outside of this green box so all the things that pass through here um, need to be enforced and, and, and verified inside this green en environment that they have been applied correctly. And then in the end, our application is, 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 is a living thing, right? So we need to, to update that. We, they need to communicate with each other. So one part inside a green box need to communicate with another, knowing that's also a valid confidential container um, and it, it can establish a secure channel. So there are all of these in-betweens and all of the things that really made it hard to get started with confidential containers. And this is precisely the point where um, yeah, we, we started to build, build Contrast as a tool framework, whatever you want to call it, to, to get going, to get started, and to deploy an application uh, based on this, on this technology. Um, and if you really want to break it down, uh, what, what we did, um, Basically, one thing was, or one key insight was that we need to do this at a station in a scalable way, right? So we need an at a station service, something that itself can be deployed inside the cluster that itself is verifiable and act as a trust anchor and basically transitively does all of the at a station verification in, in, in a scalable scalable way um, by yeah, doing all of, verifying these individual parts providing them with a form of identity so they can um, authenticate each, each other uh, and and um, make this this whole thing handleable. And then the second part we, we, we wanted to solve is how do we um, how do we isolate our pod from this Kubernetes environment and how do we verify that what passed through the API server is actually ending up correctly inside this environment. So this was the was the second part. And in in contrast, the way we 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 solve this is yeah we we built this at a station service. We made this at a station service verifiable by running itself inside a confidential container. We call it the the coordinator. Um, we basically synthesize um, a um, let's say a a what we call a manifest, essentially a document that specifies how our deployment should look like. So what containers should be part of that and of that uh, environment, what their runtime environment looks like, right? So um, as I said, right, the th things that we specify in the YAML files, we synthesize that into a, a manifest. We configure this attestation service with the manifest, and then this attestation service transitively verifies all of our pods, provides them uh, with their credentials, um, ensures that they have correctly applied this runtime environment. And inside this pod, there's an agent that yeah, does the the, the attestation of our coordinator that ensures that um, the configuration as, as specified in the coordinator is actually enforced inside this, this confidential container. And then in the end also provides a way of yeah, securely communi communicating with, with each other. Um, this is very abstract. Uh, we'll see this in, in a practice in a second. Uh, Paul will show, show a demo and then we can go also in, into more details. But yeah, in a very abstract way, um, this is basically what, what Contrast is about, right? It's about the tooling for deploying a confidential container-based application and a testing, verifying it uh, as the crucial aspect of, of how do we establish trust in this system. And in the end, um, all of this can then uh, be also verified by a third party. So as a third party, I have the central trust anchor inside this deployment. I can connect to that and I can obtain an attestation statement. 
So in, in the scenarios of uh, I, need to very, I need to verify that my deployment is isolated in the cloud, um, this can also be done in a scalable manner without the third party or us really needing to interact with this living deployment that might change over time and, and, and scales and so forth. Right. Um, jumping into 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 the demo or into the more practical thing, I uh, think then, then uh, things might get a bit more clear. Um, from an operational point of view, in, 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 in contrast, we, we basically see three parties or three um, um, entities, right? One is whoever provides this container image, and that could be anybody. Right? This could be uh, a third party. That could be um, us as the owner of this deployment. And then there's somebody who deploys and operates this 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 platform, right? And this is the the, the role we will we'll take in the demo. Somebody who deploys an application. Um, this application is provided by us in, in form of a, a, a Helm chart. Or no, it's, it's YAML files. Um, doesn't really matter. Um, so we consume these YAML files, these container images, and we need to deploy them in the in the cloud. And in the act, there is a third party, a, a data owner that communicates. Uh, with our application, needs to verify this application, establish trust, and then uh, provides data to to the actual to the actual workload. So, us as the the workload operator, our perspective is, uh, with contrast, we obtain a CLI interface, a command line interface um, that allows us first of all to install all of the requirements, install this runtime, install this attestation service, um, take the existing deployments. Um, do basically synthesize this this manifest, this attestation evidence from the deployment, provide our attestation service with that. So we send this to the coordinator, verify the coordinator, and then we deploy the actual application. Um, and inside the application, um, there, there we inject a small init container. This init container does all of the confidential computing specifics for this, for this part. So it does the attestation part. It connects to the coordinator, provides its attestation evidence. The coordinator verifies that, um, and then our init container can bootstrap uh, the rest of the, um, the the yeah the, the pod, basically starting the the application container um, and starting a, a small sidecar, or put, uh, optionally starting a small sidecar that takes care of um, TLS MTLS connections between other confidential containers. Um, that's roughly the the the, the flow. Um, I'm gonna pass on to to, to Paul to um, do a quick demo. Are there any any questions already? I mean, this was quite a lot to to comprehend. Um, my plan was that with the demo, things get a bit more clear and a bit more concrete. But if there are any questions already on this, um... maybe just to clarify, the contrast does not require constellation. Is that true? It's a separate. These are two separate projects. Yes. Oh. Okay, and the, and then, um, it's basically through through Kata is the one supported method currently for contrast. Exactly. Yeah. This builds up on the confidential containers project, which builds up yeah. on Kata. Yeah. Okay. Um. Just just kind of curious on your your path here. Is is there um is there a good alternative for I you know I, I think you're targeting Azure uh, to start with is there a is there a path to try to um do this more generally or um you know what what really do other cloud providers need to need to start providing to to give you the the basis of the technology like for the non bare metal case yeah for for the non bare metal case um. What we need is we need to create these confidential VMs. Um, if we're not talking bare metal, uh, basically this gives us the option nested virtualization or this peer pod, this remote hypervisor principle um, that, that that's a bit more uh, needs a bit more explanation. But um, since nested is not available in in, in KVM um, and no other open source hypervisor, at least to my knowledge, um, basically the the other path is this remote hypervisor, this peer pods principle, and there exists. Uh, uh, um, a sub-project of confidential containers ca called the, the Cloud API Adapter, which 
which basically is this shim layer that uh, talks to the cloud API and creates those uh, external VMs um, and then yeah takes care of connecting them back to the to the cluster and so forth. And this cloud uh, API adapter, this is what needs to be implemented. Um, so you need to have confidential VMs as a uh, let's say infrastructure as a service, and then you need this this cloud API adapter. And this is what Google uh, AWS provide um, inside the project. There are all the other listed ones, or basically the, the implemented cloud API, cloud API adapter uh, implementations. I don't know out of my head which other cloud providers already implemented this 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 part. Um, sure. But yeah, this is the the other way. Okay, and and that would basically mean the the confidential VM part is just external to where the pod is running. Correct. Okay. Um, I, out of curiosity, do, does the nested virtualization that you are able to use is that performant enough? If the if the provider supported it, um, that's a very good question and and one I I got quite often recently. Um, so far we were not running into any issues, um, but I think it needs to be seen. We don't have any like large scale benchmarks yet or any any benchmarks in the form of really comparing this to, to regular confidential VMs. Um, yeah, but that's definitely a valid point. And it's also a point where you can say, even with nested virtualization, I might want this, this remote hypervisor concept or this peer pod concept. Yeah. And, and do, you, do you think the, the peer pod is, is, um, is kind of the, the best path or without a lot of downsides really? Like if, is, is that the kind of production uh, path here that that could work generally. Yeah, so. I think both 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 paths are, are, are valid, uh, and both have their their downside. Um, as you said, nested virtualization might have overhead in terms of performance. Uh, needs to be seen, depending also a lot on the application, I guess. Um, the the remote hypervisor just has this additional startup overhead. It might take longer for your pod to come up. It has this cost overhead right now, right? If you create an additional VM, it needs it will be built as an additional VM. Um, so there's not one golden thing, I would say, or one path that's more valid than the other. <clears throat> also, both, there, I, I think can can be can be done in production. It really depends on on the requirements. Yeah. Also, right now the the attestation story is much better for the nested uh, CVM case, because in in that scenario you can con really control like the full stack and can measure everything, including the low level firmware where confidential VMs as a cloud provider offering often come like with uh, already uh, existing firmware and so on. And yeah, you have then to do like trusted boot on top, but there are parts of the stack uh, that are not open source or not uh, measurable, so. Okay, so I, I guess really it is the, the best case would be on bare metal then really for, for this this use case with that would be the fewest trade-offs maybe is that is that fair yeah i think it's a fair assessment yeah. okay cool thank you all right um yeah paul do you want to continue do we have one more slide to show or i'm not sure uh, but yeah i also can show the the demo first I'm not sure yes uh, Can you see my screen? Is it big enough? Yes. Uh, big enough for me. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. This is good. Okay. Good. So yeah, I have here a running AKS cluster and um, some files in my local directory. The first thing that we're going to do is install the contrast runtime. So this will install all the required components onto the Kubernetes node, including the hypervisor and the image needed for the CVM. And we're going to install um, yeah. the coordinator, Oops. which is our central uh, attestation component and also works um, as a certificate authority in our deployment. 
So what this is booting up, um, I have prepared a demo emoji Voto. This is just like a, a demo use case for a distributed uh, microservice application. Um, and one important thing is that we have here the runtime class, um, which indicates that we want to run this, um, this deployment in contrast. So first I'm going to use the contrast, contrast steel eye um, to um, add policy annotations to the deployment. And this will um, now um, yeah, mostly analyze the, the deployment and the required uh, container images and create policies. And these policies are then later transferred into the CVM and enforced and restrict what, uh, what container requests um, or a CRI requests can be made into that CVM to, uh, so that like the control plane can um, interact with the actual container runtime inside the CVM in a controlled manner. So this is already done. So we now have uh, here a quite big annotation um, with, the, with the container policy. And in addition, we have added an initial uh, an init container, which is the contrast initializer. And this is uh, just an init container that facilitates the attestation um, flow and uh, certificate pulling with the coordinators. So we don't have to touch our workload and the workload uh, does not need to be aware of attestation. And we also have automatically installed the contrast service mesh which is a proxy to the workload container and does all the uh, MTLS encryption uh, within the deployment. Uh, further, the generate command created the manifest. So this is just a simple uh, JSON file describing the reference values that the coordinator will later use for, uh, for the attestation part. So here is one policy hash for each um, part of our workload and the general reference values that uh, we use to um, attest the CVM. So next, um, I have to get the IP of the coordinator. And we have to set um, the money or configure the coordinator with the manifest we generated. So now the, the coordinator has our um, definition of the deployment we want to, to have and can enforce that. And next, we're just going to apply um, our deployment. And now the, con the workload containers will come up and the, the initializer is going to do the attestation with the coordinator. Um, if the attestation is successful, the coordinator will issue a workload certificate um, for that pod. And yeah, then the workload can start and all the workload parts can communicate with each other over the service mesh. So, what we get uh, when we do the attestation of um, the coordinator, which is already done in the, in the contrast set command, um, is that we receive a mesh certificate, which is the certificate of the coordinator. And we can use this certificate to connect to any workload. And as the workload uh, is provisioned with a certificate issued by the coordinator, we can, uh, after verifying the, the coordinator deployment, we can connect to any workload without having to do any further um, attestation. 
just relying on the certificate verif verification. Any questions so far? Um, it's a very technical oriented question for the meeting itself. Uh, we still have another presentation, right, today. Okay. Uh, so how long would uh, the, do you need more? I mean, if you don't want to see more, we can cut it here, not sure. I mean, how how much time do you need for the? Uh, about fifteen minutes. We have to pay. Okay, yeah, then I think I guess we have to cut it here. Apologies. <laughs> All right. Okay, yeah. Um, I can go rapid fire through this presentation. Um, thanks, Danielle, for the time check. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen really quick. Uh, is everyone able to see? Yep. Okay, great. So hi, everyone. My name is Sachi Desai. I'm a product manager at Microsoft, specifically in Azure Kubernetes service. And we're going to discuss enabling open source large language models um, in Kubernetes using Kaido. So we're going to start with the background and uh, motivation behind this project, then dive into the design a bit, talk about features that are going to be released um, coming very soon, and then the work that we've been involved in in related special interest groups. So starting off with background. So in natural language processing, neural networks are not new. Um, generative AI and large language models are used every day by most people using messaging apps and in many different contexts. And the idea of attention within these um, types of language models allows for understanding the ambiguity of um, language and conversation in different contexts. So transformer models specifically made make word by word prediction context aware and accurate. For example, um, in the iMessage app when recommendations are given for the following words in a sentence and um, using like that kind of data and applying attention within those models. And when it comes to large language models and from small language models to large, it's important to consider the cost aspect and that can often serve as a barrier of entry for people that are getting started experimenting with language models in various contexts. So what contributes to cost are the number of parameters and the trained tokens within the model. And decent inferencing performance requires the use of high-end GPUs and loading the neural network weights into GPU memory. So for some context with relation to popular uh, models that you may have heard of, um, GPT-4 has a trillion parameters um, and has one specific model within the family that has um, 40 billion um, parameters and then I believe a 7 billion parameter version. So oftentimes use cases for people who are, um, or application developers that are new to incorporating large language models and generative AI within their applications might start off with a pass like platform as a service. And that can be useful starting off, but typically when transitioning to large data sets and working with proprietary data, you want to kind of ring fence um, all of your processes within, um, your Kubernetes cluster, specifically when working on Kubernetes. Um, you want to have a certain level of data residency and following the compliance and security regulations of your organization. And that's where um, there may be limitations with SAS or PASS. So in that case, for Kubernetes and having a cloud native um, solution, your specific concerns that you might be looking to remediate are, as I mentioned, data or security compliances, um, also infrastructure observability, cost optimization, customizing your ML framework, um, cluster management, et cetera. Um, going back to infrastructure observability and also flexibility. So if you're looking to choose what kind of GPUs that you want to run 
your language models on and leverage different sizes, for example, based on your familiarity with that kind of infrastructure, that's where um, that level of customization outside of a pass can be really helpful. And it seems that the um, cloud native community is ready. Um, as seen at KubeCon Paris this past year, a lot of the discussions were around language modeling and generative AI and those kind of optimizations that could be made across networking, scheduling, um, different serving groups that popped up, such as the serving working group uh, within the like CNCF community. So many open source large language models have become um, available that have the Apache 2 or MIT licenses, allowing for distribution in various contexts. And Hugging Face is um, a public hub for most required resources. And outside of inferencing, um, provides tooling for fine tuning, et cetera, and really building out your entire like workflow with language models. So yeah, to become cloud native ready, um, you're looking for making the model weights, the runtime engine, and of course, um, cloud native Kubernetes all open source and working together. And well, initially, it may seem that for ML engineers that onboarding language models onto your Kubernetes cluster and running them may be simple, specifically with containerizing your models and having that portability that's similar with your other microservice that you might be running in your cluster. But as outlined here, there are a lot of onboarding steps, such as maintaining the large model weight files that can be over 200 gigabytes in size, building and hosting the model containers in a private registry, provisioning compatible GPU infrastructure, so knows, knowing what is the right size GPU for my model, not having idle node costs, for example, and um, optimizing in that sense, uh, tuning your model deployment parameters, um, and et cetera, as uh, outlined here. So with some other large language model related projects, um, they may claim to support Kubernetes, but in that sense, there is they abstract Kubernetes as a compute resource provider instead of abstracting the large language model as a cloud native application and really extending that for um, other processes within your ML lifecycle. So this is where Kaido comes in. So Kaido stands for the Kubernetes AI toolchain operator. And there are different parts of this name. So Kubernetes, of course, leveraging the ecosystem as an operator. Um, Kaido follows the classic uh, Kubernetes operator and custom resource definition um, like uh, framework. So streamlining workflows as an operator. Um, and specifically tool chain. So deploying tools other than a platform as a service. And this is the basic um, like interface with starting off with Kaido. So looking at this uh, custom resource definition, particularly there are some um, like aspects of it that I wanna point out. So two working parts to Kaido are the workspace controller and then the node provisioner controller that work together in automating the deployment of your large language model in a Kubernetes cluster. So right here within your workspace, you would define what model you're looking to deploy, specifically in this case, the Falcon 7 billion model. And what is helpful here is that we give a recommended minimum GPU size to start off with. So if you're not familiar with what is the right size infrastructure that you want to deploy your model with, you can kind of start off with um, this size that's within the CRD already. Um, and everything is defined here. So the resources that you need, as well as the like inference service. So again, yeah, noting that as Falcon 7 billion model. And once you deploy it, you apply your CRD, you can track your workspace and all the things um, that are components of it. So tracking your resource readiness, inference readiness, and workspace readiness. And all of this is sped up and can occur within just a few minutes, as opposed to the in the steps that I outlined previously, just understanding it and doing the investigation yourself can take up to days, just as a general like application developer, um, Kubernetes operator, et cetera. So 
what um, Kaido is able to provide to you then is the IP address to then interact um, with your large language model. And you can kind of connect that to any um, LLM uh, user interface in that sense. So you can chat with uh, your model right within your cluster as seen here. So as I mentioned, one um, uh, major component of Kaido is the node auto provisioner, and it leverages core APIs from the Carpenter project. Um, so right now using the machine CRD and in progress is a uh, plan to use the latest node claim CRD. So an important point that we want to make is that Kaido does not um, configure auto scaling currently. And why is that? So why pre-provision um, the GPU nodes? So it avoids the steps of configuring the auto scaler, which can be complicated for um, users just looking to onboard and get started with their large language models. And specifically, um, when pre-provisioning, you can configure different GPU SKUs for your workspaces based on performance requirements. And that really comes into play um, with the type of model that you're looking to deploy. And with auto scaling, that is not typically um, allowed for the users as well as um, another point is allowing to do model-specific pre-flight validate um, on your CRD. And regarding storage, so a read-only copy of the model data is sufficient to support inference as well as fine-tuning. So this also reduces the number of tools that you need to use in combination with each other. So inference is typically read-only, Fine-tuning fine generates updates that are created as an additional layer within your neural network. Um, and then they will be redeployed again when you run inferencing with what is known as the adapter layer, which I'll go into a bit. Um, and yeah, so cloud storage, cloud object storage, local storage, um, that is not necessarily... Um, needed in this case, and you can just kind of store everything within um, a container file within a private container registry. So that includes the model image and then the tags. And all in one, this is what the infrastructure looks like. Um, so you can see the workspace controller, node provisioner controller working together. And as of right now, um, the node provisioner is provisioning GPU nodes within Microsoft Azure, and we're working on extensibility across cloud providers. So right now it's we're, it's leveraging the AKS Carpenter provider, and we will be expanding to um, Google, Amazon, et cetera. So what's coming soon in the upcoming release, um, we have a three month release cadence for the open source project currently, and new um, capabilities are customizing your large language model with what I mentioned earlier as um, fine tuning. So a lot of the times with um, language models that are open source, they're trained on large corpora of data collected from the internet from various sources. So the results that you get when interacting with them um, may be specific in some use cases and in others may have slightly outdated information. And when it comes to your own um, proprietary data within your organization, you may want to make it more specific, more context aware in that sense. So that's where fine tuning comes in. And from a very like high level point, um, when you want to, it's the idea of conducting inference with adapters. So once you introduce a newer data to um, retrain your model on, it creates an adapter layer that's introduced into the neural network and then um, you would just run inferencing again with that entirely um, new fine-tuned model on um, newer incoming data. So this is kind of what the a diagram of what that would look like and how the CRD, um, like their workspace uh, changes a bit. So you would define um, in that sense your all your tuning parameters here and you would choose your method of fine-tuning um, I won't go into the specifics of it, but um, LoRa is one of the methods, and then uh, QLoRa is a, a quantization, um, like variation of LoRa. And 
Yeah. So this is going into inferencing with adapters. So once you've stored that um, adapter layer, you would essentially pull it into your new inferencing job and um, run your model again that way. So I know we're at time. Uh, this is the last slide here. I will also drop the link to a project in chat. And this is the involvement we've had with other working groups um, and the upstream SIG. So device management and serving. Uh, Kaido specifically is a partner within the serving working group. And we're also um, contributing to white papers on um, scheduling related uh, optimizations that can be made for large language models, as well as um, tackling auto scaling within um, AI and ML workloads on Kubernetes. Um, yeah, do you have any questions? I'm also uh, open to answering questions offline afterwards. I guess uh, everyone have to let it uh, sink in. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> it was a little bit short on time there, but um, yeah. yeah. If you want, you can also attend a meeting on July 18th and take a bit more time and the agenda is open. So I think, uh, by the way, that means that the next meeting would be on July 18th because the next occurrence is on July 4th. And I think uh, people in the US would have better plans on that date. So um, I think we would skip the next occurrence. Okay. Um, all right. So if there are no questions, and since we are over time, I'll uh, try to uh, be respectful for everyone's time. And thank you so much. I apologize for um, not handling the timing a bit better in this meeting. Um, but yeah, we, we, if you want to, can definitely um, add a, another occurrence. If there's something that we skip. Oh, by the way, did you also present it in the AI group? In the working group? Um, I've presented in the app delivery group as well as this. Um, not in the AI group yet. When do they meet? I uh, can't uh, remember on top of my uh, my head. Does that one know? Yeah, so we we, we meet bi-weekly on Thursdays, uh 10 p 10 a.m. PT, but then we're trying to uh, update the meeting time as well. So if you can uh, reach out on WG Artificial Intelligence Slack channel on CNC Slack, that'd be great. Like I, I can take forward from there and help you schedule a slot there. I definitely think we should have yeah. like, one slot for Kaitos there. So. Is there a meeting today by any chance? No, it's the next week. Next week. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to invite you to the channel, but there are a couple of people with the same name. So I hope I invited you. Uh, yeah, I'll check on that. Um, Rajas, if you don't mind sending a link as well here in this chat, then I can yeah reference it. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for attending this meeting. And again, apologize for the um, uh, challenging time management here. Um, and I hope to see you next time on the 18th of July. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah.